This Feral Audio episode is brought to you by Don't Ever Change. That's my podcast. I'm John Roy. That's where we talk about high school. If you like Rick and Morty, we have a new episode with Justin Roiland. He is both Rick and Morty and the co-creator of the show. And if you like that one, we also have Dan Harmon, the other co-creator of the show, on one of our other episodes. So check it out, feralaudio.com. Don't Ever Change. This goes out to the New West Surf Company in Ventura. May Poseidon's blessings be upon you, my brothers of the sea. Friends, I've just returned from the Ram Dass Open Your Heart and Paradise Retreat in Maui. I've just had the demons fire hosed off of me by some of the great teachers of our time. Jack Cornfield, Sharon Salzberg, Ram Dass, Mirabai Bush, Krishna Das, and today's guest, David Nickturn. So I feel great. I go to those things just swarming with foulness, just covered in neuroses. The callus around my heart, it gets thick. Thick is the yellowed callus on your aunt's foot that you shall be massaging on this holiday season. I've been sitting here trying to summarize all the stuff that I learned at this retreat, and I can't do it. Either it's too complicated, my explanation's too complicated, or it's too sappy. I don't know. There's no pithy way of explaining what this stuff is. But here's a fantastic quote that I think does, in some way or another, summarize what these retreats are all about. The quote comes via Jack Cornfield, and it's from someone named Guam Guame Apollinaire. I can't pronounce it, but at least I could say the quote. Now and then, it's good to pause in our pursuit of happiness and just be happy. That, to me, sums up what these retreats are all about. And there's an argument that's been raging all around the planet for a long time. And the argument goes something like this. This is a catastrophe. We're in a catastrophic situation here where by some kind of rotten series of coincidences, our molecules have harmonized in such a way that we've temporarily become aware of ourselves and that our realization of what we are is limited by our biological lifespan. We are assembled by accident into a world of pain and in some painful way disassembled and pushed back into an infinite field of oblivion. To which people like Jack Cornfield respond by reading poems like this one. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like a salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, You must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you've been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. That's a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, that was given to us by Jack Cornfield. And the whole retreat is made up of stories and poems like that and teachings and contemplations. And you end up feeling like somebody has rescued you from a tub 
of hot diarrhea that you didn't even know you were taking a bath in. So I'm so happy that these things exist, and I'm very happy to present to you today's guest, David Nickturn, who blew my mind. He's a student of Chogyam Trumpa, and uh, for those of you who don't know Trumpa, check out Crazy Wisdom on Netflix, or you can check out his book, um, or he's got many books, but uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism is a particularly good one. He's a fierce teacher, and Nick Turn is uh, also a fierce teacher, but a funny teacher, and I'm thrilled to have gotten a chance to have this conversation with him. We're going to jump right into this podcast, but first, some quick business. Hey, New York, on Tuesday, January the 17th, I am going to be at the Bell House in New York doing a live DTFH. If you want tickets, you can find the link at duncantrussell.com. Friends, if you notice a sudden decrease in sound quality, it's because I'm using a poop microphone because my old microphone just blew out. So we're going to make this super quick. The holidays are approaching. Everyone's happy now, and that's one of the beautiful things about the holidays. Every single person everywhere around the planet, their hearts are filled with joy, love, happiness, benevolence, compassion, and they understand the most important truth which is that if you want to show love to other people, you should give them material objects. It's the only way to truly express that deep part of the self that says, I love you. It's why we shop. And for this Christmas season, I have placed inside the DTFH store a very special thing. So special, it's difficult to describe, and so special, if you happen to be listening to this, On Friday, December 9th, it might not even be in the store yet because we have to stock it. But what it is is handmade LED DTFH logo lamps. And we only have 10 of them in stock. Takes a long time for these sweet darlings to get constructed. They're all made by one person in a workshop, much like the elves make beautiful gifts for Santa far underneath the ancient mushroom of life that dwells in the heart of the sun that floats in the center of the hollow earth. So uh, check out the DTFH store if you're interested. These things are crazy. They're glowing, magically infused LED lights that I have enchanted an incantation over and which I've also signed the back of. They're super cool. We only have 10 of them. So if this sounds like something that appeals to you, hurry over to the store, won't you? Uh, Also, if you're planning to do any kind of Christmas shopping at all, might I advise you to not throw yourself into the terrible rat warren that is a mall or a chain store. Why do you want to experience what it's like to be a parasite in the intestinal tract of a gnashing demon howling in the depths of time? The gnashing demon, of course, is known as consumerism and materialism, and though we all Most of us can avoid the necessity of existing in the marketplace. We certainly can avoid the horrors of having to squirm through the Jacob's Ladder style entrails of a public shopping area, gazing into the glassy-eyed horror of all those who have been sucked into the terrible hypnotic vortex that is the strange compulsion that has been injected into our brains that we should, at this time of year, when days are shortest and the darkness is particularly greasy, hand each other gift-wrapped presents, or even worse, feel bad because we happen to have managed to be alone this Christmas. Oh yes, you turn on that TV and the glittering lights of the view will convince you that you're in some kind of hell realm because this Christmas you happen to not be surrounded by people. But let me tell you, friends, If you find yourself in a situation of isolation during this Christmas, it only means that you are special and that you are blessed. For the rest of you who are going to be exchanging presents with other people, why not go through our Amazon link? It's in the lower left-hand corner of our website. If you have ad block up, it might not show up. Uh, We also have it in the comments section of any of these episodes. You click on that link and you buy anything, 
that we talk about on this podcast or anything at all, and Amazon will give us a small percentage of that. An HTC Vive, an Oculus Rift, the new amazing PlayStation, some kind of phone thing, recording equipment, musical instruments are always a blast, annoying bells and gongs for your friends' children, whatever it may be, boxes of glitter, it's all there for you at Amazon.com. All you got to do is click through our link. For those of you who continue to support the podcast this way, my eternal gratitude upon thee. We also have t-shirts, posters, and stickers in the shop. I hope that you will take a Christmas look through our wares. Okay, friends, here we go. I feel very happy about this podcast. If you do happen to be listening to this on Friday, December 9th, and you live in the Los Angeles area, you want to go see David Nick turn on Saturday, tomorrow. No, it's last minute. I wish I'd gotten this podcast up sooner, but I ran into some technical difficulties, so I couldn't. But if you do happen to be in town and you want to go see David Nick turn speak, then there's going to be a link in the comments section of this episode. All right, everybody. Now, please place your hands together. Put them at your chest, forming the... Uh, sign of the enlightened Buddha and bow in the direction of the incredible Buddhist teacher, meditation guide, and did I forget to mention Emmy award winning musician and composer David Nickturn, who's got a brand new book out right now called Awakening from the Daydream. Links to that are going to be at duncantrussell.com if you feel like picking up a copy. I am almost finished with it, and I love it. He gives online workshops, he gives meditation classes, and he's an all-around super cool human being. All links to get to him will be at DuncanTrussell.com. Now, everybody, welcome to the DTFH, David Nickturn. Duncan, it's my pleasure, I think. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> you know, I have um, been coming to these retreats and watch, I've watched you play guitar, um, but I had no idea. I completely missed out on the fact that you were a student of Chogim Trumpa, Trumpa Rinpoche. And this is, he's always been one of my favorite buddhist teachers and also he's irritated me more than any other teacher there's such a quality to his teachings that are so frustrating mm -hmm. and confusing <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about how you came into contact with him in the beginning and what it was like to be a student of one of the great buddhist teachers sure in yeah. modern times <clears throat> excuse me um well it all started innocently enough so in 1970, I was going to the Berklee College of Music, hence the music side. But I was also studying um, yoga, hatha yoga, at a studio near, the, near Berkeley on Marlboro okay. Street. And the woman who uh, owned the studio was one of the people who brought Trung Rinpoche over to the United States. So um, she helped sign the papers and so forth. So when he came to the United States... Uh, he, that was one of the earliest stops was teaching a, a weekend seminar at her at her studio and it was called work sex and money that was the title of it cool Which kind of blew my mind a little bit and i would say at the time i was kind of more in my yoga hip hippie phase and right. um i was completely startled when he came he was in a western business suit right already why did he choose that form of dress <clears throat> well what happened was of course he was raised a lot of people don't really completely understand this as a High Lama in Tibet um, right. before the... He was an incarnation. Like yeah, he was the 11th Trungpa Tulku. Right. Very long line of uh, Kagyu Lamas. So they, they, they did the ritual of the whole finding thing. him. Yep. They took him as a child, yep. brought him back to a monastery. Yep, exactly that. And if you want to read about that, there's a book called Born in Tibet, which is a really great travelogue if 
if not way more than that for people. So um, when he was nine years old, he was doing advanced tantric practices, you know. And when he was 12, he was running the whole group of monasteries so called Sermon. So um, probably at a fairly young age, I'm going to say he must have been in his late teens or early 20s, uh, they had to escape from Tibet. So he took, a, it's, this whole story is told in that book, Born in Tibet, he took a group of uh, about 300 people through the mountain passes being pursued by the uh, Chinese soldiers. So, um, and they would go off into caves and do divinations about which ways to go wow. to, to, you know, and they were at some point eating their own boots. They were cooking pieces of leather from their own boots as sustenance. So it was a very harrowing escape that he made. And then they made it to India like a lot of the Tibetans did. And once he was there, he spent some time there. And then he kind of, to make a long story short, wended his way to England, and he studied at England. Um, and while he was teaching in England, I think he noticed a lot of fascination about the Tibetan thing, and he felt like he wasn't really going to be able to teach people that way. Uh, so he really, his changing garb was really him entering our environment and trying to connect with us. Um, and he also married a young British girl, um, at the time, so I think it was, was part. It was part of his journey to do that. Is he considered an, an apostate? Was he considered <clears throat> sort of uh, someone who was outcast from the religion? That's uh, that's the, how I. That's how I understood the story. Is that no, he, no, that's a complete mistake. That's not true. Yeah, no. So he was even at that time wearing the suits, marrying somebody. He was still considered to be yeah. in high standing. Absolutely. Well, here's the thing: is that's part of the Tibetan tradition, the tantric tradition. Some of them, some of the lamas are married. Lamas. Okay, cool. So I, I misunderstood yeah. that. No, uh, there might have been one or two of his close associates who were concerned about it, but really Trungpa Rinpoche is the one who, you have to really remember, brought all the high Tibetan lamas to the United States because we had an organization at that time and we had a platform to, to land. So he brought over Karmapa, he brought over Kensei Rinpoche, uh, Kalu Rinpoche. We hosted those teachers, so he was in very high regard um, by those teachers. In fact, the Karmapa gave him the title of uh, Vidyara, he gave him. He really empowered his what he was doing tremendously. Can you talk about that first class <laughs> with Chogyam Trungpa? Yeah, for for whatever reason, it's astoundingly vivid, even though it's forty five years ago. Um, but the funny thing about it, it was kind of like a workshop, like we do now. He would just go around. Maybe there are eighteen or twenty people there, if mm-hmm. that. Um, and he would give a talk about a Dharma topic, and then there'd be discussion, and then we would practice meditation together. But at the time, you know, he would give each person individual meditation instruction. So you went up into a room with him, and he gave you instruction. Alone with him? Yeah. yeah. What so, was that like? Did, now, I, you hear all the time about qualities of these great teachers, especially incarnations. Did he? Did did? Were you fascinated with him in the beginning? Did he emanate some mystical field? <laughs> Work, sex, and money was the title of the workshop. <laughs> you know, um, actually, here's what really happened: the Friday night of the workshop, he gave a talk, and it was kind of dry. Um, yeah. You put together, oh, this is this high lama, and now he's talking about these sort of charged topics. Right. Actually, it was very flat and very ordinary. And I, I got slightly bored, actually. Okay, and cool. so when I was walking home, that was where I had a mild, mild epiphany. I went, Dave, to myself, what are you, what are you tripping on? What are you looking for? Because he was grounded. He was down to earth. So I flipped the switch and I went like, this guy really kind of is connected to right. reality. It wasn't like some spiritual realm. It wasn't like that at all. Okay. Yeah. So he wasn't meeting an expectation someone might like because we i'll tell you what i would want levitation yeah. a vivid aura yeah. a sense of <laughs> i've known him forever well let's let's modulate a few of those things okay um, i remember somebody asked him about levitation at a public talk and he said well sometimes when i eat this particular kind of blue cheese i get close <laughs> but he had a great sense of humor and uh he had a very subtle communication sense so you could feel that somebody was you know 
operating between the lines uh, and uh, really, really very spacious but very sharp. So if I had to tell you his quality, it was a v- kind of very spacious but very clear and very sharp mm. uh, and very friendly, very open. I always felt very um, uh, like, oh, this is somebody you'd really want to sit and talk to for a while. Well, you and you did. He became and I did. Your, he became your teacher. Yes. I so, did. how does that work? So, you, you it starts with a yoga workshop. Yeah. You take this this class, and then what happened? So that weekend went by, and that was, I guess, the fall of nineteen seventy. I think that's as close as I can figure out to when it actually was. And then uh, I kind of wanted to explore it more. So he was beginning to set up communities. One was up in Vermont at this place called the Tale of the Tiger, famous place. That's where I met Ramdas. Okay. That's what's funny about all this being here at the retreat in Maui. Uh, so um, he would just start teaching, and again, like it's similar to what we do now, it would it'd be on a topic of Buddhism, like the Wheel of Life or something like that. But you went up there. I went up there. You moved. No, I didn't move at that point. No, I was living in Boston. Uh, uh, later on, I was the director of Tale of the Tiger, Karma Chilling, but that wasn't until 1978. Okay. So I was studying with him while I was moving around. I would go back and forth between my regular world and going to st- take classes with him. And also finding his little community of students and practicing together with those. But during that time, I lived in Boston, then back in New York, and then I moved to California. So, okay. So, I'd, so I had, you know, with my, my musician life was in full bloom at that point, and I would be like... A, a not unusual week was, you know, I had a band with Jerry Garcia for a while in, in Northern California called the Great American Music Band. And I'd be doing that one weekend and then the next weekend flying to Boulder to take a seminar with Rinpoche. That is it, so trippy. It, 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 it was trippy and ordinary because that was just my life that, at that point. Well, and not that your yeah. life has gotten any yeah. more normal. You, no, I guess. <laughs> you travel around. Yeah. Krishna Das, yeah. um, do you attribute this kind of good fortune to reincarnation or to, <laughs> um, to, to anything like that. How do you explain it? I mean, to, to be in a band with Jerry Garcia while studying under Chogyam Trumpa, it sounds to me, it doesn't sound normal at all. No, no, okay. it sounds spectacular, <laughs> yeah. but it sounds so far away from maybe what most people's experience of normal life is. Well, I like to live this way. These will be the good old days. Right, right. So we are here in a spectacular, you know, uh, just for your listeners, we're here at the retreat um, that's headed by Ram Das and Krishna Das, who, who, for the listeners, if they don't know, I'm his pro- record producer and I play guitar with Krishna Das. So uh, that's really why I got here in the first place. But then the connection with Ram Das, and um, this year I did a little teaching also in the Buddhist uh, framework. And they, we also have a couple of great uh, Buddhist teachers here, usually um, Jack Cornfield or Sharon Salzberg. So we're in a pretty spectacular, and we're looking out at the ocean here, right. ladies and gentlemen. And yeah. it's pretty spectacular, and we all just had an amazing morning together. And it's a, a group of 350 or 400 very uh, um, warm good-hearted and smart people yeah so to me this is pretty pretty this is kind of spectacular yes it is but this, this is just a another bead on this incredible necklace that you've been putting beads on for decades and i look we don't have to get into whether or not you saved uh, which you clearly did at some point probably saved a village from uh, avalanche in some <laughs> past life or, or who knows <laughs> who knows what you did we don't have to get uh, into that but I, I as i was sitting with you on the beach when we first started talking mm-hmm. uh and you were t- talking about trump or Rinpoche, and then you were telling me that you had written this book mm. which this is really exciting to me because it's something that i have been interested in for a long time haven't really understood it very well uh, you have a book called Awakening from the Daydream, Reimagining the Buddha's Wheel of Life. And the uh, Wheel of Life is really interesting to me uh, because when, years ago in my early days when I took LSD, mm. I can remember hallucinating what I think if I could go back in time, I would. I think it was probably 
something like the Wheel of Life, some fiery mandala, mm-hmm. some incredible. But back then, I was just like, "This is nuts, man! It's a crazy <laughs> wheel." And then uh, you and any lots of people have seen this symbol, and I don't think yes. they they know exactly what it is. Yeah. So um, what I love about it is. Uh, Particularly with Chogyam Trumpa, some of his writings are impossible for me to understand. Mm-hmm. I, it's very complicated and simple mm-hmm. at the same time, mm-hmm. infuriatingly simple, maybe mm-hmm. that it's, uh, it becomes complex. But what I love about the Wheel of Life is because it it, it is a visual representation sure. of the teachings of Buddhism, and so I can. It, at least in some way, I, I it helps me understand it. And now that I've been reading your book halfway through. It's such a concise teaching about this. That's what I'd like to spend the rest of the podcast talking about. Um, so can you just sort of describe the Wheel of Life for folks listening and yeah. maybe tell them where on the internet they can go to pull it, pull it up if they yes. want to look at it while sure. you talk about it? <clears throat> well, the Wheel of Life is a classic, as you said, Buddhist mandala or arrangement or symbol. I call it a PowerPoint presentation from the past because it's uh, thick with information. It's dense, but all unpackable. So that's the key, right? So it actually dates back to the time of the Buddha, the original uh, drawing, supposedly given at the advice of the Buddha from one king to another king. Like, here's a great gift that you could give this other this other king. So the the Buddha described it to him? Yeah. Said, he here's what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. As, cool. as far as we know. Okay. Now it's on the outer wall of a lot of monasteries because it's considered a teaching, even though it has the dense sort of concentrated aspect of the Buddhist teachings are really all in there. Like if we spend a month on it, we could unpack the whole, the right. whole thing. But it's considered somewhat secular in the sense that it was given from a king to a king as opposed to a monastic kind of tradition. Okay. So it's for people like you and me to decipher our lives. Right. Uh, it, it, you know, here's the thing, Duncan. I see you working at the puzzle down in the lobby there. Yes. That's what this is. It's like this is the puzzle that the Buddha put together. And, and it would be great to tear this apart, turn it into little pieces, and have you put it back together. Pretty cool. And that would be exactly what we're doing in a way. Just so you guys know, there's a very addictive puzzle in the lobby of this retreat. And somehow... Many of us have been sucked into this awful vortex of the thing, but um, the so the the I'm really interested. I guess well, why don't we just start yeah. at the center of the thing? Okay. So at the center of the uh, this mandala, you have a pig, a snake, and a rooster. Right. And these are considered the fundamental delusions. Right. Well, let me just, I'll get to that in one second, but just to frame it, um, if you do want to look along as we're talking, Mm. you could. Um, There's, as I said, the classical diagram, but what I did is I had a modern painting made uh, by um, an Australian artist and um, with Wisdom Publications in the book. And so we tried to update the imagery so it has the same meaning, but it's very much more accessible to a modern person. So, and it's cool. It's beautiful. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's kind of uh, uh, sort of like Japanese anime kind of vibe to it. Yeah. But it's so the book is called Awakening from the Daydream uh, by David Nickturn. You could go to Amazon dot com and you could see the picture, and then you could also blow it up. <clears throat> you could zoom into it, which is what it's meant to be done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, there uh, as, as Duncan's implying, what what there are is concentric rings of information, um, and. It's interesting to start with the outermost ring and the innermost ring and then work your way to the most prominent ring, which is called the six realms. So let me start with the outermost uh, phenomenon, which is there's a skeleton, which (laughs) actually looks like a Grateful Dead kind of thing in this drawing. I was looking at this skeleton. (laughs) This is like a vampire skeleton. This isn't just a skeleton. You gave the skeleton fangs. This is a Nosferatu skeleton. Well, the idea of the skeleton is, and, and, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama has said this, and many people have said this. It represents impermanence. It's, right. it's really, it's not so much a vicious kind of, a, a, you know, uh, energy as much as just a fact of life. All of this experience, just like this podcast, is going to be subsumed by impermanence. 
Right. You and I are sitting here. It's really vivid. It feels really strong. We're having whatever energies, reactions we're having. It's going to be over. Right. <laughs> That's the biggest, one of the big Buddhist facts of life that you, that you uh, kind of address. But the depiction of this impermanence in, in this updated version and in the old versions, it's not, they don't never make it benevolent. It's, it's always, not benevolent. No. Because it's ruthless. Right. In, in the same way that death is ruthless. Right. It comes to everybody. Um, there's, uh, you know, the Buddhists don't court death. We don't, we don't go like, how can I jump off of the balcony here? Yeah. But we know it's coming. And we contemplate that uh, to, to, you could say, to sharpen our insight about um, the whole situation that we find ourselves in. Right. Not, not be deluded about it. You're living in a, you're living in a memory, you, if you even remember anything. You forget almost everything. It's... <gasps> Well, that's the daydream idea, is that there is a kind of awakened quality to the present moment that everybody here is talking about. Yes. But we tend to drift off from that. Right. It's, it's not considered a, a kind of a crime or a sin in Buddhism. It's just kind of a habit. Sure. It's just a habitual mind just takes you into one of these six realms. So we'll get to that in a minute, though. Okay. So at the center of the wheel, as you pointed out, are the three... Um, animals, the pig, the snake, and the rooster. And yes. again, these are metaphors. <clears throat> the pig represents ignoring, kind of uh, dullness. Yes. The snake represents aggression, you know, fighting back, pushing yeah. back. And the rooster is passion. Yeah. Right, for obvious reasons, I hope. Humping. Exactly. What is the rooster trying to do? It's so funny, though, because <laughs> whenever I think about humping, rooster <laughs> is not what comes to mind. Well, uh, but what about hens? If you if you were, it's a horny bird. I get it's it. It's a horny bird. I, <laughs> back then, I was like, you would think, yeah. like, what's the horniest yeah. animal? I guess you'd say the rooster. Well, it just represents the t- aspect of passion that's acquisitive. You wanna you wanna pull things into your territory. Is it always a rooster? Traditionally, it's a rooster. So we left that alone. Okay, cool. those are the same three traditional animals. That it's like that. We didn't change that. And and so the rooster is desire. The rooster is desire. The snake is aversion. Right. And the pig is ignorance. Exactly. And I changed some of the words around a little bit <clears throat> because there's nothing actually wrong with desire. That's not the problem. The problem is grasping. Right. That where you desire something, you objectify it, and then you try to possess it. That's when we get in trouble. And 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 and. What's interesting about it and, and is that this entire wheel of suffering yeah. spins on that central spoke, which yeah. is the interaction of those three modalities. Very, very beautifully stated, Duncan. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and and there's an essential point there, which is that those I call them the RGB of of the whole wheel of samsara. In other words, they're the three, like on a TV screen, you have red, green, and blue. That's all you have. Right. But then you create the entire world or mandala of, of experience from those three basic instincts. That's it. And okay. it's not like you're, uh, uh, in any given moment, just one of those is functioning. It, it, or, are they all three kind of interacting in different ways? Exactly. At the same. So in any given moment, of these three... Something is probably more prominent than the other, but they're all for a moment. Yes, they're they're all interacting in some way. Well, that's why those animals are holding each other's tails. Right. If you look at the subtlety of it, <clears throat> they're creating a kind of spin cycle by by relating to each other, uh, and then that creates the entire activity. You're exactly right of the rest of the wheel. So again, looking at this, I don't choose to look at any of this material as arcane. I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm not a scholar. I, I want access to information that's relevant to what, you know, ordinary day-to-day living situation. Yes. So in this case, you just go, you, I tell people, walk into a yoga class and you'll see, um, you, I want to put my mat right down next to this person, right? Oh. <laughs> I thought you were talking about aversion. Walk into no. a yoga class, you're like, what the fuck am I doing this for? Well, this you is going to hurt. You could, <laughs> well, that, Okay. Good enough. Yeah. Or you could say, you know, this person next to you is kind of sweaty and blowing their nose a lot, sure. putting their tissues right between yeah, your yeah, mats. Yeah. Get them over to the other corner of the room. We immediately are starting to orchestrate our experience around our own uh, kind of sense of personal comfort. Right. Yeah. Right. And you don't even notice most of the people in the room. You're either pushing yourself through a self imposed force field or you're getting sucked into some, or you're or rushing towards a thing that you want. Uh, I understand a, des- I understand aversion and I understand desire, 
But how does the how does ignorance work? What is well? That's why I change. <clears throat> Trump Rimsky used to call it ignoring. Okay. He made them all into verbs because it's an active process. Okay. We think of ignorance as a kind of dullness or pastiness of mind. Yeah. But really, there's a kind of, um, you could say at the level of the, the awakened mind, there's a choice being made to black out certain phenomena. Yeah, like I'll pretend you're not clearly a white supremacist right now because you're my <laughs> uncle and we're having lunch. <laughs> well, that's really specific. Yeah. Uh, P.S. Michael's that, that would be as, as you said that would be a mixture of aggression and, and ignorance right. okay right right which what do we call it passive aggression right so um, yeah as you start to mix those colors together they start to look like different things you know if you're um, you know if you're into S&M that's a mixture of passion and aggression right right yeah sure so the ignorance is the most pervasive though because we're really not noticing most of what's happening Whoa. around us and that's considered that's the most Wow, that's interesting. I wouldn't think that. You think it's the least harmful, but it's actually the most pervasive. Huh. So that's why we say waking up or awakening or use words like Buddha or Bodhi. Coming out of that field of ignorance is is really the job. Wow, that's really cool. Um, okay, I never thought that. I would always I would think aversion was the big problem. Aversion creates the worst karma because you're kind of like um, actively destroying something that is is you're creating harm. Um, that creates a lot of momentum, as you know, like abuse. You know, if you beat the crap out of somebody, there's going to be consequences. That's considered aversion. Yeah, that's aggression. So that in Dharma talk, you know, in, in Buddhist Dharma talk, that's the one you mute first. You dial that down a little bit. Really interesting to think aversion equals aggression. I, that's confusing to me. I, I think of aversion as like, <clears throat> well, I don't really want to go to this party or I don't want to <clears throat> go to this do this job or i don't want to sit down and write or i don't want to exercise i don't feel like eating that food or i don't mm -hmm. that to me how is that aggression well it's interesting your aggression is sort of mixed with ignoring it's just what we just were talking about i'm not going to go there i won't do it but what if you are living with somebody and and this is a typical guy thing i think you'd admit i need space you say i need space yes. that's called ignorance <laughs> <laughs> how so well, in other words, you don't you're not comfortable in the field when it gets hot or you know there's some edge or aggression in it, and you try to subdue it by creating a false sense of space or spaciousness. Wow, right? That's cool. I think calling it a passive passive aggression is good enough for, for the time. You think being. needing space is an, an illusion like if you're Oh yeah, there's nothing but space. Why would you need it? <laughs> that is so trippy. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, if I'm laying in bed and the cat and the poodle, and the chihuahua, and my girlfriend. Are... In that order, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, you know. <laughs> There's a realm for that. We'll see. <laughs> That's the animal realm. Mm. But if I'm, or, if, so, but if I'm, so if I'm in that situation, and I start mm. reacting to it. Yeah. In a way where I'm like, God, I got I just need a little bit of space here. Sure. That you th you're saying that that's just an illusion. I should be able to grab the space, no matter how many animals are laying. Well, it is a kind of space. Right. It's just not the kind that you want. Right. <laughs> so that's aggression, aversion. You don't want a, a simple definition of aggression could be not wanting to be where you are. Wow. And acting either. You know, then you either mix it with the sort of passive or the active version of it. Wow. So, for example, in the lowest realms, we're not there yet, but when you go into the six realms, start to spin. L let me just get us there. Okay. So these three basic sort of feelings, and, and we don't have time to get into it in depth, but, um, but, but people who read the book will get into it in depth, and people who study it will get into it in depth. The, these kind of three torques or, or kind of momentums that are created – begin it's not enough to just feel like i don't want to be here you create a narrative that's where the whole birth of the blues is okay the samsara or the cycle of suffering would not it wouldn't be enough information just i don't like this you'd be like a caveman you know i love her i don't you know you'd be kind of just the stupidest version of those things but we need to create a whole narrative around it like right. the reason that i'm upset now is because not just because my poodle and my chihuahua and my girlfriend are making me feel claustrophobic but my whole life i've had this tendency to feel this way because of my family life and now you're in the therapist chair and you're, yes. you're spinning in the narrative of the hell realm wow right which is now there's a whole realm a whole disney world that you've built out of this simple kind of quality of aversion right 
So there's a lot of support. It's like you start making the movie of that. Right. <clears throat> and, and it's just not true. It's situations created. How did this come to, how did we come to be sitting here? And then also what we're doing in the present, how that's going to ripple into the future. Right. So it's the past congealing as the present and then the present rippling and creating the future. Yes. That's, that's the process of karma. It can be a more or less confusing or more or less enlightened type of patterning. That's the whole point of this. Okay. So like, for example, if you practice the loving kindness practice, you're forecasting a better future for yourself. Right. Right? You're creating a better narrative. Yes. Right. So that's called the relative truth. It's not that you... Buddhists would never say you don't exist. They'd say your existence as an individual is a relative phenomenon. Okay. Okay? It's based on relative causes and conditions. Right. It has no absolute basis whatsoever, though, and that's an interesting point. Okay. There is no Duncan template anywhere. No. This is just a bunch of... Uh, an infinite number of modes of phenomena that happen to be swirling together in just the right way to temporarily create yeah. a yapping dude with a beard. Yapping dude with a beard. But we don't belittle that. This is a very important point in Buddhism that, that's misunderstood, I think. We don't belittle that or say like, oh, that's just your ego. You know, That is the relative self. Right. Okay. Um, and there's words for it and so forth and so on. The problem is we get too caught up in it. I mean, you could almost say it's as simple as that. You get yeah. fixated, you get stuck. Right. So these six realms are kind of expressions of like you went way overboard with your feeling of retaining a sense of depression and claustrophobia. You could let go of some of that. Yes. In the present. Now, you couldn't change the past. A beam of light comes no. into the room for a second. Uh, it's my. Well, we um, both have to do stuff now. Uh, this is clearly a conversation that you can have for hundreds of years. Oh, yeah. And people have been having for hundreds they of years. They have, actually. So where can people find you? Because I know you you teach this. You give seminars and classes, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I if you go to David Nickturn, uh, David, the usual way, N-I-C-H-T-E-R-N.com, that's a good way. Or Facebook page, the professional Facebook page. Um, usually there'll be postings and you know workshops and teachings that are going on. But, you know, to start with the book, it's called Awakening from the Daydream, Reimagining the Buddha's Wheel of Life. And it's on Amazon.com. That's the easiest way to get it, or in bookstores near you, or on Barnes & Noble, any of great. those places. So I think that's a great way to start the conversation. And then um, if, you, if you go to, if, if usually pick up, people pick up a thread, like somebody like you will just start talking about something like this, and that turns into a thread. Right. That's, you know, uh, and then I'm actively teaching out in the world uh, in addition to playing music, as, as you know. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks for listening, everybody. That was David Nickturn. All the links you need to find him are going to be at duncantrussell.com. God bless you for using our Amazon link. And if you like this podcast, give us a nice rating on iTunes. Subscribe to us. And subscribe to the idea that the present moment is all you got because we're in a spinning wheel of delusion being eaten by a vampire skeleton. I'll see you real soon, friends. Hare Krishna.